So turn to Matthew chapter 27. What we're going to talk about this morning is the man named Barabbas and how Pilate had said, Who shall I release unto you? Will it be Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? And they chose to release Barabbas. How could it have come to something like this? And who was this Barabbas? Now I'm going to read the text to you. <clears throat> and as I do, I want you to notice, Pilate did not want to crucify Jesus. He did not want to deliver Jesus to be crucified. He was looking for an out, looking for some way to let them go. There was a custom in the land and that was that at the time of the feast, you could turn one prisoner loose. He picked the one that he thought they would least likely want to let loose, Barabbas. They said, no, let Barabbas go. We want Jesus crucified. And the more he pled with them, the more they said, no, crucify him. And so you'll see how Pilate, as I read this, look at all the, the things he's about him. He didn't want to do it. And I highlighted that in the reading as we go through to show that he knew Jesus was a just man. He'd heard from his wife. She'd had a dream, have nothing to do with this just man. He knew it was for envy that they had delivered him. And he's trying to find an out, to find a way to let him go. And poor old Pilate, he could have done it, but he was not the man to do it. And it ends so pitifully as he's trying to wash his hands of this matter but he couldn't do it. Now, when we read this washing hand, you remember Macbeth? You, did, did y'all ever study Shakespeare and remember Macbeth? Shakespeare pulled off on this. Remember Lady Macbeth? She had these, she went crazy in this, being guilt ridden, and she was always washing her hands, always trying to wash the blood off of her hands. It wasn't there, but she thought it was there. She's washing her hands. She was crazy, see? And she'd look at her hands, she'd see the blood she shed, and she'd try to wash her hands. And that's sort of like what Pilate here is doing. And Pilate had not lost his mind. It was being symbolic. But it shows he didn't want to have anything to do with this. But he could not escape his role and his guilt in having Christ crucified. So with that background, <clears throat> let's read this text. Now that the feast of the governor was wont to release... Now at the feast, the governor was wont to release unto the people a prisoner, whom they would. And they had then a notable prisoner called Barabbas. Wherefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Who will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. When he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many nights this day in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said unto them, Whether of the twain will ye that I release unto you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate said unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why? What evil hath he done? But they cried the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I'm innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and our children. Then released he Barabbas unto them. Barabbas! Did you notice what it said about him? He was a notable prisoner. 
Why, this just wasn't some run-of-the-mill prisoner. I mean, if he'd read the papers or watched TV and back in those days, he would have been all over the news. They got Barabbas, and, and look what Barabbas has done, and here's the judgment of Barabbas, and everyone would have known that. He was well known as a despicable character and a notable prisoner, and yet they're going to release Jesus, I mean, re release Barabbas, and crucify Jesus. Here's what it says about Barabbas, Matthew 27, 16, notable prisoner. Here Mark 15, 27 tells us a little more. There was one named Barabbas, which lay bound with them that had made insurrection with him, who had committed murder in the insurrection. Luke 23, 18 through 19 tells a little, little more. They cried out all at once, saying, Away with this man, and release unto us Barabbas. For a certain sedition made in the city, and for murder was cast into prison. And then John 18, 40, Barabbas was a robber. Robbers in those days would waylay you on the streets or they'd take what was yours and Barabbas is using this to, to fund his evil that he's up against. Sedition. Well, that's trying to undermine the authority of the government. Why, wow, that would have been a, a, a direct threat to Pilate, wouldn't it? Somebody trying to work sedition and then insurrection. That's not just saying things and trying to, to sow the discord. Barabbas had stepped up to do something in, in raising up an insurrection against the ruling government there in Jerusalem, of which Pilate was the governor himself. Barabbas had committed murder, and they got him. And so a notable prisoner... Now, the time was right for insurrection. That's one thing you got to remember when you read the life of Jesus and understand some of the things which were done and also understand it's easy, isn't it, to see how the meek and gentle Jesus went about doing good and healing people while so many would flock to him, but many came hoping he would be a Messiah as Judas Maccabees had been a few generations earlier and raise up a force and overthrow Rome that was ruling Jerusalem and let Jerusalem rule itself and let them rule the world in an earthly kingdom. And there were many reading the Old Testament prophecies and, and looking forward to someone that would come up with this earthly kingdom and the earthly rule. And so there were men that took advantage of that and persuaded the people that they were going to be a, a Messiah like this. Well, when Peter and John were arrested, they were going to put them in prison. But there was a wise man named Gamaliel. In fact, they were going to kill Peter and John. But a wise man named Gamaliel advised them against it. And in the advice that he gave the Sanhedrin about Peter and John, he mentioned some of these that would try to raise up an insurrection and how that all came to nothing. They tried, but that didn't work. That's not going to happen. And so Matthias says, I mean, uh, uh, Gamaliel says in Matthew 5, 36 and 37, before these days rose up Thutis, boasting himself to be somebody. Boy, that doesn't, that, that doesn't remind you of some people. They like to boast themselves to be somebody. So here's Thuda, boasting himself to be somebody, to whom a number of men, about 400, joined themselves, who was slain, and all as many as obey him were scattered and brought to nothing. It didn't come to anything. Thuda's tried this. He tried to be an earthly Messiah. It came to nothing. There was another one. After this rose up Judas of Galilee. You know, one of the apostles of Jesus was named Judas. That's the one who betrayed him. There was another also had the name of Judas who wrote the book of Jude. And Jesus is of Galilee. So that sounds kind of like this, doesn't it? Remember Judas of Galilee, Gamaliel said, not Jesus of Galilee, but you remember this Judas of Galilee? This was not one of the Lord's apostles. Is one of these false messiahs, one of these false Christs going to raise up an insurrection? 
Well, Judas of Galilee in the days of the taxing. It sounds like they were upset about taxes. You ever heard about people getting upset about taxes? You remember that? Remember the, the Revolutionary War? That taxation without representation? Well, these fellas was upset about the heavy tax burden they had. So what are they going to do? Well, they're going to overthrow the government. So here it is, Judas of Galilee in the days of the taxing and drew away much people after him. He also perished and all, even as many as obey him, were dispersed. These guys can't do anything. Now you let Peter and John go. Don't, don't bring their blood on us and, and get Rome angry at us for taking matters into our own hands. Just let them, it's not going to come to anything. These guys try this and it doesn't work. When Paul was arrested at the temple, the Jews raised a tumult. And they saw, the, the, the chief captain saw what they were doing down there in the temple courts. He saw it was all, they were going to take Paul and stone him. Now you just didn't do that. And the chief captain, he's responsible for keeping order. He sends the Roman soldiers in the midst of that bob, and they essentially rescue Paul. But he got an idea. I think I know who this Paul is. I bet he's that Egyptian that we've been hearing about to be on watch for. You know, we got the notice, watch out for that Egyptian. So he arrests Paul. Paul asked him in the Greek language, can I speak to the people? He said, well, you speak Greek, aren't you that Egyptian? Here's what he said. Art thou not that Egyptian, which before these days madest an uproar? and led us out into the wilderness 4,000 men that were murderers? Well, we don't read a lot about that Egyptian, either in the, the Bible or in history, but there's another one. There's three already, wasn't there? Thutis and Judas of Galilee and, and this Egyptian, and, and there are these guys taking advantage of what the Jews thought was the time for someone to raise up an earthly kingdom like David and be king. And Jesus wasn't doing that. And it was because of that, with all the attractiveness of Jesus, that many turned away from him. They were looking for political solution to their physical problems. Jesus came to offer a spiritual solution to their spiritual problems. And they didn't understand the significance of that and turned away. Now some thought maybe Jesus was going to do that. They thought well, that's what he was about. In Matthew 24, verse 5, and 23 through 24, when Jesus was warning about things that happened after he was crucified and before Jerusalem is destroyed, he said, there's going to be more of these fellas. And he calls them false Christ. And so he says, many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. See, that? they'll say, I'm the Messiah. I'm the one promised. I'll get us free from Rome. If any man shall say unto you, lo, here is Christ or there, believe it not, for there shall arise false Christ. Many of these false Christs had arisen. And Barabbas, it's kind of like that. A thief, a robber, a murderer, sowing sedition, and raising an insurrection, and they caught him. Let me tell you something else about Barabbas, kind of interesting, that name. Bar-Abbas. Did that ring a bell? Maybe you hadn't thought about how it put together like that. You know what bar means? Son, the son. You remember uh, <clears throat> Peter was Bar, was it Bar Joseph? Who it's Bar, Bar Judas, Bar, who was he? Bar Jonah, Peter, yeah, Bar Jonah. The son of Jonah, Peter. He's called Peter Bar Jonah. That's what Bar means. So, uh, Barnabas, remember Barnabas? It was a nickname for Barnabas. That really wasn't his name. But they called him Barnabas, son of consolation. Barnabas always encouraged him. Oh, he's a son of God. Just call him Barnabas. Like a nickname. This almost sounds like a nickname. Bar Abba. You know what? Abba. Remember the prayer? Abba. Father. Abba. We sing it in the song. 
If indeed it may, let this cup of anguish pass from me, I pray. You know what Abba means, don't you? It means Father, put them together. Bar, Abbas. Okay, it means the son of the father. Well, that's kind of an interesting name. I wonder if that was a nickname, like Barnabas. He got sort of a nickname. wonder if he was like his daddy. Yeah, Why, well, he's causing trouble like his daddy did. You know, you can see that. But maybe more than that, because there are some of the old documents where his name is not just Barabbas. They call him Jesus Barabbas. You know what Jesus means? That's the Savior. Jesus, Son of the Father. It's got a messianic ring to it, doesn't it? I mean, it sounds like Barabbas is putting himself out. As, I'll, be, I'll be a Messiah. You want a, you want a Messiah to get, get Rome off your back? I'll be that man. And he kills a man trying to do this. And he's, trying to do, he's doing it all wrong, but he's taking advantage of that situation. Some say that may have been why Pilate suggest this anyway, while we knew he would call Jesus, who shall I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus which is called Christ? Do you want me to release unto you Jesus which is called the Son of the Father or Jesus which is called Christ? Which Jesus do you want? Well, they wanted them to release Barabbas. Now, it's interesting, too, to me that what they were accusing Jesus of, he said he was a king. Remember that? You see, they had accused him of blasphemy in the Jewish courts, but now that they're before Pilate, they couldn't put someone to death for blasphemy. So they made him out like Jesus is some kind of insurrectionist. Now here they've got the real thing. Were they really worried about an insurrectionist? They have the real thing right there. Barabbas is one. Let him go. And yet put Jesus to death because he's an insurrectionist. Doesn't it show the hypocrisy of those that had come to, to release him? There's just so much into this. Now some wanted Jesus to be like a Barabbas. In Matthew 11, 20, at 12, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. They're thinking of earthly kingdoms and Jesus is pointing that out. And there were some that wanted Jesus to be made the Messiah by force. John 6 verses 14 through 15. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle Jesus did, this is when he fed all the many with a few loaves and fishes. They saw that. They said, this is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force and make him a king, he departed again into a mountain to himself alone. He, he wasn't going to do that kind of kingdom. He wasn't coming here to, to take over by force and he wasn't going to be taken by force into something like this. So he just slipped away. He avoided those people that wanted him to be that kind of Messiah. We read in Matthew 12, 19 through 20 about Jesus. He shall not strive nor cry. Neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed shall he not break. A smoking flax shall he not quench. Jesus was not some rebel rouser trying to stir up a mob against the government. Matthew 22 and verse 21, Jesus said publicly in the temple, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. You don't know oh, where Jesus stood politically? Look, they're the ones in charge of earthly things. Submit to the earthly powers. That's what you do. We're not here trying to, to raise up rebellion and sedition against the government. That's not what Jesus was about. In John 18 and verse 36, he stood before Pilate and he said this, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence? Not from hence, that means not from here. 
Pilate understood that. Pilate said, we need to just let him go. This is not a threat to us. This is not a threat to Rome. But the Jews wanted him crucified. So you had two men. And one is going to be released. And the other is going to be crucified. Now that reminds me of something I read in the Old Testament. Remember how the Old Testament, there's shadows and figures of that which is to come. And one of the things that the Jews would do is as instructed by Moses in the Old Testament is found in Leviticus 16, 7 through 10. And here's where we read about the scapegoat. You've heard that expression? He's just the scapegoat. We're going to blame him for all the problems. And Well, here's where this comes from. Because two goats are brought to the temple to be sacrificed. And one is released. And the other becomes a sacrifice. Here's how it's written in Leviticus in the old law. He shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat, which is the Lord's lot fell, and offer him for a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement with him and let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. So you had two goats, one sacrificed, the other released into the wilderness. And here in the New Testament, as though you're seeing that reenacted in real life now. What's all that about? Here it is. You got two men. One is going to be crucified. And the other is going to be released. wonder how Barabbas felt. It says here in Romans 5, 6 through 11... When we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet preadventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom we have now received the atonement. Okay? Jesus is crucified instead of Barabbas. He benefited directly in a physical way from the crucifixion of Christ. But that's why Christ came to be crucified anyway, in our place. Here it is from the prophecy, Isaiah 53, four through six. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet did we esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. And we all like sheep have gone astray and turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Okay, put yourself in the place of Barabbas. This is the day you will be crucified. And here comes the guard. He's coming for me. And the guard said, Pilate says you can go free. <laughs> and Barabbas is free. And then, and then he's going to realize, you know, an innocent man was crucified that I might be free. How would that make you feel? We don't need anything else about Barabbas. You know, I would like to think 
that Barabbas became a child of God and became a Christian. He should have, shouldn't he? I mean, of all people, shouldn't Barabbas have realized, oh, look what has happened. But we don't read about that uh, happening. Seems like maybe we would have read that if it had happened, but we don't read about that. But how do you think Barabbas would feel? Okay, you see, think this though. How does that make you feel? Because Jesus died for us too. It's your sins and your iniquities. He bore the price for us. Let me borrow the words of the prophet here. Change it just a little bit to make an application. All we like Barabbas have gone astray and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. You think Barabbas should have become a Christian? I do. I think he should have. Well, you know, I think you should too. I, I'm, I'm glad I'm a Christian. When I read this, it makes me want to be a Christian. If he died for me, I want to live for him. How ungrateful to turn from him after what he's done for you. And so you read these stories, you might think, you know, just for honor's sake and self-respect and esteem and just how to being grateful for what he did. I need to be a Christian because he's died for you. Now the way to do that is to be baptized into Christ and if you've not been baptized, that's what you need to do. And then you live your life for him in appreciation and thanksgiving and with joy, knowing what he has done for you and the benefit that has come your way. If you want to respond to that, then do it as we sing this invitation song while we stand and sing.